I have a guest with me today. This guy's got more energy than me. And uh, so I, 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 I so appreciate that. Um, we met in Arizona at, uh, at uh, AmFest. And uh, we uh, have like-minded uh, goals. We have uh, so much in common. But this guy goes be uh, so above and beyond in his support not just for the American law enforcement officer, but for American ideals in general. So uh, the minute I met him, I knew you needed to meet him. Henry Hollywood Morris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Let's see. It's an honor to be on with you. And, and like we shared in Arizona, we were supposed to meet. <laughs> I firmly believe that. I, I wish people could see you and I standing next to each other because I, I, I'm i about at your waist. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> you, you are you are you are what we would call backup. I, I yes. stand behind you. <laughs> um, so uh, talk about first of all, just tell folks a little bit about you. Yes, I, I always lead in. But would I live the American dream because of the sacrifice uh, that not just first responders in general, but especially personally in my life, uh, law enforcement, police officers made because uh, I am the product of a kid who grew up in a two parent household, but both my parents were functioning alcoholics. So they worked, you know, Monday to Friday, uh, held down stable jobs, but alcoholism was the norm of the day. And, and in that case, with the two of them, that led to domestic violence on the regular. That was my introduction into uh, meeting police actually was in some negative uh, situations because they were called out so frequently uh, to our home. So uh, you combine that with a kid, I'm born in uh, 1976, so grew up in the 80s and 90s. That was when the crack epidemic exploded. And, and you know, there have been numerous documentaries made about it. And I'm always amazed by them because, again, growing up through it. So growing up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I share this was not what you see on the tourist commercials <laughs> marketing Miami and Fort Lauderdale. This was this looked more like New Jack City or uh, Boys in the Hoods for, the, for those people that have a certain age that remember those films. So literally... Um, walking, uh, the bus stop was only a, not even a half a mile from, from our duplex, but basically there were three crack houses. So in three of the directions that you could go, you know, as a kid going to elementary school, we literally would have to pass a crack house. One was almost directly across the street from us. So watching, uh, the narcotics units come in and, and even seeing at 10 years old, what they had to deal with that. The drugs are destroying the community, yet when the police come to investigate, no one knows anything. That just blew me away as a kid that, you know, what I was seeing at 10 was not what I saw at eight. And how could the adults think that this was normal, you know, or a good thing? Uh, people walking the street aimlessly at two o'clock in the morning is not normal. I didn't realize that, sadly, until I, you know, grew up and moved away. So that was, uh, but but at the same time, the D.A.R.E. program started in the 80s when I was in elementary school, having police officers, I thought was the coolest thing when you're in the third grade and police officers come out and rap about saying no to drugs. Y you know, it's been thrown around sometimes now almost in a, in a backhanded way that just say no wasn't enough. And I responded that it was for this kid. Uh, by the time I got into high school, Sadly, school resource officers, because of the violence on campuses, had become, you know, a normal thing. But both of the officers that I had, uh, Officer Rubenstein and Officer Panetta, for my four years, like literally, I was the kid everyone adopted. Let me just point out one thing to any law enforcement officer, retired law enforcement officer watching this. You remember all of those police Correct. officers' names. Correct. From high school. So, you know, this is the thing. Very often, as... As police officers, we think, oh, well, they don't remember us. We're just some person in a uniform, you know? Yes. You just prove that's not true. And and we're going back. <laughs> we just went back 35 years plus. You're right. So you like you said, for some of you, definitely, uh, you may not remember the agency they worked for, but you remember the impact they've had on your life. And even the, um, the officer that I can't remember because 
I, I had to be eight, seven or eight years old, but this was one time, you know, no child should have to experience watching, you know, one of their parents arrested in front of them. That was my experience again, because in this case, I had shared before that uh, my dad actually, you know, attacked my mom in the car on the way to work on I-95 and, and threw her out of the car. So when the police arrived, we're getting snatched out of bed at three o'clock in the morning, not understanding what, you know, you're, you're eight years old. You, right. you have no idea what, what is going on. But um, that officer outside, you know, of course, they're, they're trying to get the children to safety because my dad was known to carry weapons. It was, again, he was known, you know, well known by law enforcement. So for that officer to come over to us and uh, my younger brother, Maurice, was either seven or six at the time and my older sister was 10 for him to say you know your dad is not an evil person he has problems that makes such a difference you know in in an eight-year-old's life that right. that officer has no idea at the time how that is going to play out decades later wow wow that's which is why I speak up so much now. <laughs> right, exactly. So how did you uh, come to be the founder of an organization called Support Our Shields? Yes, it was, well, I'll go right back to where we just left off, was going down the straight and narrow with the help of and guidance from, you know, those police officers and coaches and teachers I went into media. So, you know, of course, every 17 year old, see that's, that's six, three and 200 pounds thinks he's going to play in the NFL. You know, three knee surgeries later, <laughs> I realized that that's not going to happen. Uh, but I always had a, you know, love for video and, and video production. And so literally 20 plus years go by, I go into business for myself. I almost exclusively work with churches you know, nonprofits had done actually a lot of local and state campaign work on, on different uh, political campaigns, you know, during the multimedia. And to be honest, Betsy, I was oblivious to a lot that was going on because you're married, uh, you know, you're, you're living the American dream, you're working hard, you know, and if you don't have a lot of interactions with police officers, other than my Mention for speed, <laughs> when the guy that's had a lot of sports cars, uh, <laughs> that, that was really the, the basis of my, you know, my interaction. 2020 had an impact on every one of us, you know, in, in so many ways, thinking back now that that's, we're literally four years removed. And when I saw the defund the police movement explode, because of, and, and I had a very, very unique perspective as if, because remember, we're in a shutdown. You know, this time four years ago, we're starting to hear rumblings about some virus. <laughs> you know, which I, you know it's, 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 we're getting buzzed now and people are actually starting to post, but no one is taking it as serious as it would come to be, right? Well, most at that time, I had probably 10 accounts all across the country of various churches, National Baptist uh, Convention. So I'm literally traveling because the churches are now shut down. They're flying me in to record Sunday services, you know, pre-record. Right. And I'm watching the media and these activists say one thing. And when I say media, we're talking about mainstream, you know, all of the major networks. But yet I'm in Cleveland. I'm in Cincinnati. I'm in L.A. It's not the job, you know, it's not the story that they're selling. And I'm seeing, but what I am seeing is going to these churches, they are in quote unquote, you know, what is referred to as the black church. I don't like that term, but so those communities, I'm watching the lack of police presence and what is happening. You know, as you're literally watching in real time, it get worse and worse each month you fly in. Right. And I'm thinking this is insanity and it's also intentional. And I, I would say the final straw, watching officers have water thrown on them, you know, we saw it happen in multiple cities with police precincts being, you know, burned, attacked. And David Dorn was the final straw with what happened with that Facebook Live. And so I found myself literally at a crossroads because, so picture this, this 2020, because of the lockdown, I'm having the most successful business year of my life. 
because now everyone needs the guy who's not afraid to fly, you know, and go out to come record their churches, you know, uh, virtual services. But I was so convicted because I knew all of this white supremacy, white privilege, systemic racism lie. It, it was a lie. Wow, that that is extraordinary. I want folks just to see uh, a minute of yes. uh, of what you do. For three years, I've watched police be defunded, demoralized, dehumanized, and demonized. The lies and the propaganda have led to skyrocketing ambush attacks and has made this the most dangerous time to be a cop in my lifetime. Last year, 249 officers were killed in the line of duty and most of America doesn't know their names. I couldn't sit back anymore, so I went to them. I went to Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, Rutland, Vermont, Shatek, Wisconsin, Fargo, North Dakota, Eastland, Texas, Tacoma, Washington, and McKeesport, Pennsylvania, to name a few. So you took your your testimony and your passion and you decided to honor the fallen yes. uh, fallen officers in this country. Yes. Tell me how you got there. I'll, I'll start. I'll take you back to 2021, Betsy, because like I told you, those decades of really just not being aware, be, you know, because I didn't have an immediate family member you know, that was in law enforcement. Well, when I thought, I was like, actually you do. My first cousin, you know, is in the state of Alabama was a police officer, but because he was never around much because of work, when I would come to town, I had no idea, you know, what his career was. I just thought it's a shame. He can't, Sam can't be around. Mm -hmm. He was the first person I reached out to. And I literally traveled there to sit down with him. And it blew my mind. I never knew how, that he lost his partner never knew how that affected him until we sat for two days and talked. And he was the one, uh, retired officer Sam Curry was like, look at the numbers. And that was how I found the officer down website. And he said, do you realize he showed me 2019 in 2020? Yeah. And he said, this is not going to get better. And I understood from my media background, you know, you're taught if you want, especially if you're trying to sell a product or an idea, you know, you do the jamming, but you, you, you hammer what you want the audience to walk away with and you distract or you intentionally don't show what you don't want them to know. Mm. And I thought it, it made sense. I said, this is a play. This is an intentional play. Why don't we see any of these stories about these officers on the mainstream media you may get three but he's showing me we're down 200 and i was like how can that be but yet if you have the the the, the unicorn scenario that we were talking about for media is if the suspect or in many cases the criminal happens to be black and the cop is white then that's the lottery mm -hmm. and everyone knows the name everyone knows a part of the story but when we go back and get the full story, it's not the the narrative that the BLM and the media ran with. And that's, you know, that that is a story that's being repeated. So that bothered me, one, because it was we're watching the propaganda piece. Two was the effect that I was watching it have. So we were already starting to see a record number of officers retiring every, you know, it, it would seem like every city that I went to meet with you know, the chief or the sheriff, they were talking about there at least 10 officers down. Some were 30. Right. What they were afraid of was this is going to stretch the officers thin and it's going to make the job more dangerous. And that became crystal clear last year. And uh, what hit me was the age of the officers. Because you know, you get to that point <laughs> where we are, that's where we're past halftime uh, on, on that life clocking, and, and you start to look back 
Mm. And 20 was a long time ago. And uh, seeing the story, the, the first story that I got was the one uh, right before Christmas of 2022 about uh, uh, Sergeant Robin and Officer Estorp in, in Bay mm. St. Louis, Mississippi, a 34-year-old and a 23-year-old. Yeah. And so I was actually in Mississippi to do a revival for a pastor. And I wanted to make sure that I would get to Bay St. Louis. It was like two hours south reached out to that police chief Swartz and told him what I was doing and meeting with those families cemented why I needed to focus on fallen officers. Absolutely. And you know, you, you say such an important word that I think people really need to take to heart again, propaganda. Correct. That's exactly what you're talking about. What people see is the propaganda yes. that somehow American law enforcement officers are the problem. problem. And that we're, you know, we spend every day gunning down young, unarmed, innocent black men. Yes. And, uh, and you know, in reality, that the numbers don't even, uh, you know, they don't jive. And, uh, and yet nobody really wants to put that out there. Correct. It's not even closed, Bess. And actually, it's the opposite. And, and this is how this will tie in for, our, for the audience today. And literally, I watched this happen somewhat behind the scenes, almost in real time, because there the name Dr. Claudine Gay has become, you know, it, 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 everyone knows who that is, you know, the, right. the former president at Harvard because of her miserable testimony. And now we found out she plagiarized her whole career, basically. But what here's where I was introduced to her name was Roland Fryer is a world-renowned, you know, uh, economist. Right. And, and he was the one who literally, because of the headlines, he's thinking, well, this, I'm going to statistically see what is happening between law enforcement and Black men. So he goes and crunches the numbers. He was so shocked by his first finding, he fired his whole team, rehired a new team, went and embedded itself with different law enforcement agencies, and he was blown away. What he found out, though, was when he wanted to publish, mind you, he was at, at Harvard. Well, he's still at Harvard. Mm -hmm. The number, the research was unacceptable. And I literally sat and watched an interview with him because he's, he's from uh, Daytona, Florida, oh. that they were telling him the, these different media outlets don't add that in. They want right. him to remove the part that shows cops aren't disproportionately killing unarmed black men, but you actually have that age range from 17, I believe he's at 17 to 44, which of black men who make up less than 6% of the U.S. population that is committing the most violent crimes. They wanted no part of that. And so it took me all the way back to my childhood, Betsy, because if neither one of those, my mom or dad could admit that they have a problem with alcoholism, you never address the problem. The whole family was disintegrated. And sadly, though, that addiction, you know, goes to the next generation. That's what we're seeing, you know, as a nation. People right. intentionally, because they profit off of it. And remember what I told you I did. So I was behind the scenes producing a lot of media for uh, people that I realized don't want the problem solved because as Thomas Sowell said, they profit off of the problem. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, we- I've become unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, where can people go to- see what you do to support what you do and to see the beautiful plaques that you present to the families of the fallen. And just briefly, how do those families react? That has been, it's, it's hard because you're dealing with, especially last year, I, I'm, I'm in um, Vermont and Jessica Eberhausen, the officer we lost was 19. And then you go to South Carolina and Matthew Ware was 21. And you go to Wisconsin and Hunter Shield is 23 and their, their, their faces stay with you, as you know, mm -hmm. for doing this as long as you have. That is the difference for me has been to get the chance to meet with their uh, fellow officers and in some cases, the family members, because they are so appreciative. And you know, firsthand, law enforcement officers are going to be, you guys are the last ones that are going to cry for help. Mm -hmm. And it's also what makes you an easy target. 
you know, for, for the propagandists and the wokeites, as I call them. So to go in and sit down and talk with them, and, and a lot of times there's no media, but they are so appreciative of someone who they've never heard of, who is a giant in most cases, putting your arms around them and telling them how much, you know, the sacrifice that their loved ones made meant to me, what law enforcement has meant in my life. It, what I saw last year is it gave me the fuel to go to the next one because each one is hard. And, and that's, you know, it ties into when you and I met, I had just left New Orleans the day before. And, you know, you're, you're still feeling the heaviness of that officer that that family is still grieving. And so when you saw me walking down and your smile lit up, I was like drawn to you instantly. And that is, that is like the overall mission with Support Our Shields. I think Another thing that we learned out of COVID was trying to keep us separated. When yeah. we can embrace, yeah. and with you and I, we we represent it. Doesn't matter. We, of course, if you see us standing next to each other, you obviously know we're not biological brother and sister, but <laughs> we are. You know, we are in Christ, and we love our country. Amen. That is what I'm trying to be an example of, one person at a time. You know, to continue that message. So, if they go to supportourshields.com, that's the website. Like you said, they can track all of the the states and the stops. And unfortunately, because of the day and age we live in, sadly, basically, we know that this won't be the last. We've already lost, uh, I think, three this year. Mm. So the need is always going to be there. But I think that the thing that I put like on my uh, desktop here is off camera that you can't see is we can't be cowards to comfort. Amen. Amen to that. (laughs) On that note, Hollywood Morris... Thanks so much for spending time with us today. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Ma'am, put the gun down! Put the gun down! Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain.